Now you all will hear from our esteemed White House representative, and you will hear all about a whole nother career path that you can take with a STEM degree. Uh, and uh, it's actually been quite a path that our next speaker has taken. I'd like to introduce Dr. Patri Patricia Falcone. And uh, Dr. Falcone is the Assistant Director for National Security in the Office of Science and Technology Policy of the White House. Her work seeks to strengthen innovation and scientific excellence, particularly as applied to nuclear security and nonproliferation, and more broadly for homeland and national security. She's been a member of the professional staff of Sandia National Laboratories in Livermore, California since 1981. She served on the board of Army Science and Technology of the National Academies, as well as the Nuclear Deterrent Transformation Panel of the Department of Defense's Threat Reduction Advisory Committee. She continues to serve on the Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Advisory Committee at Princeton University. Dr. Falcone holds a Bachelor of Science in Engineering, of, in engineering and uh, Mechanical Sciences from Princeton, as well as a Master of Science and PhD degrees in Mechanical Engineering. I think it's actually a Master's from Princeton, we got a little bit wrong, but you, can, you know better than I. Um, and uh, so I would like to introduce Dr. Falcone. Thank you very much. Well, let's see, I think she swallowed my lead because my most important thing is that it is my undergraduate degree is aerospace and mechanical. <laughs> so I do have ties to aerospace. I did lots of time at wind tunnels and um, in labs, but I did not um, get the chance to come to work at NASA. But I was here this morning, and let me just say that uh, this topic of women, of innovation, of aerospace, of science and technology are really um, sort of my favorite set of subjects. So um, it's just terrific that you guys are all here today, and I am uh, very delighted to have been invited um, to get a chance to talk with you. Um, I'm also honored, as Rebecca said, to have the chance to serve President Obama and the President's Science Advisor, Dr. John Holdren, uh, by working in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Um, and the syllogism for what we do over there is that we work on the science for policy and the policy for science, which basically means what are those policies about the doing of science, like the doing of science and technology and engineering at NASA at other departments and agencies, and what are those important issues that, of policy that have a technical dimension, and um, we need to have an alternate path um, or a set of advisors uh, close to the decision makers in the White House. So that's what we do at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, the science for policy and the policy for science. So today, what um, I thought I might do is just spend a little time talking about two things. One, a little bit about my own path um, to working as an engineer, as beginning in aerospace, and, um, and then also about to highlight activities and actions and policies and strategies that are going on in this domain of innovation, of attracting um, more Americans to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and in particular, trying to get uh, folks that we don't have in proportions um, in our population in the STEM fields, S-T-E-M. I hope we've already been using that today, so I'm just going to say it as an acronym from here henceforth. Um, and that includes women, and that includes minorities, uh, that includes um, lots of people that just haven't been included. Um, and then answer questions. I hope we have time to answer questions. You're a really, uh, I was fortunate to hear the panel this morning, and I think it's even revved up since then, I guess, in terms of lots of engagement back and forth. But uh, let's see, I did say that my undergraduate work is in aerospace and mechanical. Um, at my undergraduate university, those two domains are together. Um, what I studied both as an undergraduate and as a graduate student is in combustion and propulsion. I was very interested in how pollutants formed. And um, so the first time around, we worked on environmental things back in the gas crisis in the 70s. 
And uh, so really understanding the chemistry of what went on um, was important to me. I worked as uh, doing an undergraduate research program, uh, research activity when I was a sophomore. And for those of you that are still in school or have yet to go to college, I guess I would like to highlight uh, the opportunities that you have at just about all universities to get involved in research with professors, because it was very important to me um, and my education and motivating classwork. And then, of course, it turned out to have been a great thing to have done uh, for applying to graduate school and for really seeing how fields come together. And in graduate school, I went to the mechanical engineering department and uh, because that's where combustion was and worked on a new laser-based diagnostic to, again, measure uh, pollutant formation and uh, try to understand the processes involved. Why did I become an engineer? Um, you know, I think it's always these things are in the dark recesses of time. The truth is my dad was, and we heard about parents this morning, my dad really said that, gosh, um, you know, if I really needed a scholarship, which I did, I was the oldest of four kids, my dad was in the Air Force, that I could really get a better scholarship doing engineering. I suppose at that time I thought I might go be a math teacher because I liked math, but I liked lots of other things. I liked to read, I liked writing. Um, speaking, things like that. But um, I didn't know what engineering was other than you could get scholarships. But what I was told then, and I guess I still think having done, worked as an engineer now for probably 30 years, uh, is that if you like math and science but you want to use it to do something, that's what engineering is. And I say that advisedly because I am married to a physicist and so I think <laughs> the engineers are uh, more on the doing things with it as opposed to just pushing the frontiers of science back. I went to high school in San Antonio, Texas, and someone mentioned Louisiana State University this morning. And I was fortunate to attend a summer science program at LSU um, while I was still in high school. And this was sort of a residual um, program to attract kids to science, to STEM, really, that was a post-Sputnik program. So it's interesting. We tried to you know, entice people. I got enticed, and it really worked out great for me. Um, Let's see, this morning we spent a lot of time on anecdotes. I have a long list of anecdotes because I went to a college that had never had women before. And I was the first woman to go through all four years of the engineering program there. And um, so there were a lot of oddities. However, I would guess that I would say that having done that, um, everything else really has been easier. And you just learn that uh, if you've got your toolkit with uh, skills in it, that um, the work is so much fun, you just use them and keep on going. So um, let's see, let me just say a few things about my own perspectives, just summing up, and then I'll talk about the President's Program, which is that, you know, there's lots of different view jobs, and I think you've already heard that today, but the fact is that engineering is really fun. <laughs> and so I, those of you that still have the chance to study engineering, I would say do it. Um, and what's fun about a job is just that you have the satisfaction then of honing those skills. You build those school skills in school, you hone them as you get uh, greater, um, you know, different assignments. You use something you learned one place on the next job. There's always something changing. It's um, just quite fun. And, um, you know, you're part of something bigger. I mean, where I have been, I've worked, had the uh, privilege to work at one of the nation's national laboratories, Sandia. And like NASA, this is a place where um, one, you can do wonderful work, um, technical work of national importance. And it has a place that um, you have both the privilege and the responsibility of spending taxpayer dollars um, on what you do. And that is a big responsibility, especially given how straightened uh, times are. Um, you can make a career of it, doing a variety of different challenges. That's what I've been able to do. Um, worked on lots of different projects with lots of different people with other parts of the government, but always growing my technical skills. And the most I know about NASA is that one of my old office mates um, and uh, collaborators, Ellen Ochoa, was selected as an astronaut around uh, 1990. And uh, so I've had the privilege of um, knowing Ellen from the time she applied um, through seeing her recently here in Washington, where she comes, as I guess many of you know, because she's the deputy director at Johnson Space Center now. 
great thing was she did come, and it's fun to have been with Ellen because, you know, if I say I'm an engineer, people's eyes kind of glaze over, and when she says she's an astronaut, it's just their eyes light up, and I think, gosh, we used to be the same. But uh, Ellen, being an astronaut, she came and talked at uh, my kids' elementary school years ago, and um, she had want, gotten an award nearby, and so when I met her, when she came to my house, she was in her business suit, and I said, okay, we can go down to the school. She says, no, no, I have to change. And I said, no, you don't. You can just come. She says, no, the kids never believe I'm an astronaut unless I'm in my flight suit. And sure enough, that was true. But anyway, so it's much more exciting, I guess, than just being an engineer. But um, let me just say that, you know, as Kathy said this morning, I thought a really good comment about your career being a journey. You know, when you tell it from the point I'm at, it all looks like it all fell together, but it's never like that. You know, you make choices. And so what's important is being open to opportunities, realizing people can't read your mind. So it's up to you to say what you like, what you don't like, what has been good about an assignment or where you might need help. Um, you have to continue learning. And my advice for jobs is always pick the hardest jobs you see with the best colleagues. So, because you always wanna have people um, that you can learn from to work with. And I would make a set of comments on work-life balance, always a topic here. Um, and I followed the advice of Millie Dresselhaus, a very famous physicist who is a professor at MIT, who at one a conference just like this when I was a young staff member, I went and someone asked her, well, she, Millie has four children, um, ask her, how do you um, be a physicist? and you know, have this family, and she said, well, the most important thing is to pick a good husband. So I think that I followed that rubric, and that's worked out. Um, I will also say that I um, benefited from both um, lobbying for <laughs> and being a guinea pig of evolving work-life policies at Sandia, uh, you know, at college and graduate school. Um, from conferences like this, I think, you know, the technical work is fun, but it's always good to check in with other women so you don't, if you're all alone someplace, that you at least feel like you've got a network to plug in. And then to stand up and make change. I mean, nobody knows, you know, necessarily what's wrong, and so you've gotta be willing to volunteer, both for in-reach activities to make your own workplace better, and for outreach activities to uh, give back to kids coming along. Um, you know, I'm sorry I missed the talk about scouting. I'm a big uh, fan of scouts. I did lead a scout troop when my daughter uh, was younger and was a Girl Scout. And uh, with this anniversary this year, I'm remembering to the 50th anniversary when I was a scout, we all made signs. And I was just thinking about this. It sounds a little creepy now, but we did all make signs to put in front of our house that said a Girl Scout lives here. But somehow in this day and age, maybe that wasn't a good thing. But at the time, I built this sign with my dad, and it was just so cool. And that was celebrating another anniversary of scouting. But let me talk, um, and let me just also say that it's just an incredible high to have had my career, to have had kids, to have worked part-time for a while, to have taken a year off when my son was born, and to have now, with my son in college and my daughter turning 28 this month, you know, to have had this opportunity to be asked to come to the White House. So I would have never guessed that would have happened. I didn't necessarily stay on the straight and narrow um, through my career. I worked on things that were hard <laughs> with good colleagues, and it all kind of works out. And I got this chance, and I think that's another thing to know that's not obvious, is that your kids do grow up, and your career goes on a long time, and there's time to do lots of different things. And what is so terrific is um, to be a part of supporting Dr. Holdren and the President um, and the First Lady and their support of issues about STEM and particularly about women and girls. Um, I have personally been able to watch um, and to staff events where the President and the First Lady have personally been focused on the goal of increasing participation of women and girls where they've celebrated teachers where they've celebrated students at the second White House Science Fair that we just had that I hope you saw some of the video from if you didn't see the president and the young uh, man from Arizona and his marshmallow cannon that's on a YouTube video and it's really worth seeing. Um, and, you know, the president, the first lady, they really do understand that jumpstarting girls' interest in STEM subjects and boosting the number of women in science and engineering um, is not just the right thing to do, but it's smart for America's future and for the economy. 
And so there's a number of programs. You could go to whitehouse.gov, see lots of pictures. We do lots of events. We've celebrated Champions of Change, trying to support you know, programs, individual programs and individual communities, because in the end, that's what you've got to do. It's about individuals making decisions, but giving them the support and painting a picture of how fun it's going to be on the other end. Um, and, you know, even the president um, hosted winners of the first Google Science Fair, and I hope you also saw that all three winners of the first Google Science Fair were women, and so an absolutely terrific uh, picture. But also, let me talk about the bigger picture about innovation. There is the president's strategy for innovation. It came out originally in 2009, was updated in 2011. And basically, the point is to have innovation for sustainable growth, growth of the economy, and for quality jobs. And um, I actually brought this triangle, because often I show it, but it's just to give you the image of a triangle, it's got kind of three parts, and let me just speak to, to them. The base is to invest in the building blocks of American innovation. The middle portion is about how do we spur productive entrepreneurship and promote efficiency in our systems. And the top is how to have a focus to catalyze breakthroughs on national priorities. So going back to the base, the most fundamental uh, part of this strategy, the president's strategy for innovation, and let me say that you can go to whitehouse.gov and read the whole document and see the charts, um, is there's really two parts to that base. First, to strengthen and broaden American leadership in fundamental research. And then second, to educate Americans with 21st skills, 21st century skills, and create a world-class workforce. And the point of a world-class workforce is to address these issues of underrepresentation, to improve the teaching of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics based on what we know now more about brain uh, function and how the best ways to learn so that we don't teach classes in a way that might turn off some students. Carl Wyman, who is the Associate Director of Science at OSTP, uh, is very passionate about this subject, about how do you actually teach science and engineering in a way um, that you know, what's called deliberate practice. It's like learning to play a musical instrument or do a sport. It's not about natural ability. It's about practicing at the level, getting better by practicing. And so there's a lot of reform movement. The President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology also has just done a, two reports in this area. And so let me just say, if you somehow heard from older siblings or something that um, engineering classes are boring, they're getting better. <laughs> And there's really, um, you know, an effort to try to make it match to all kinds of uh, different brains and not just to one way. Um, and I think the other thing that goes without saying is that, you know, a democracy depends upon an educated citizenry. And the issues are so important that everybody's got to have a fundamental basis of thinking about technical issues, about having a quantitative approach, even if they don't choose to do it as their profession. So having um, programs to increase the numbers of technically trained teachers um, at all levels, elementary school, junior high, high school, into college is just important for us overall as a nation um, to have good workers for a global economy and to have STEM uh, professionals that represent all of us in the country. So lots of people are going out and talking. There is a, the White House Council on Women and Girls um, has chosen this, or this is a key activity uh, for them, and it makes sure that every agency and all the work that it does um, considers the needs of women and girls in the decisions that the, you know each agency makes, including NASA, and I'm sure they have been engaged with the White House Council on Women and Girls. Um, so if we've got all this effort in STEM, what's the next point? And you've got role models um, to sort of entice people to say, yes, it's, you know, it's all going to work out. Um, it's great. The other thing is what are those um, approaches to making the workplace be something that people want to stay in for a career? And um, let me just say I've had a great time. Um, 
let me say more about role models. I didn't say explicitly. Um, you know, there's many women, you heard many this morning that are already in the administration, but EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson is an engineer. I like to lead with the engineers. Uh, the Administrator for NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, is uh, Jane Lubchenco, a marine scientist. The head of the U.S. Geological Survey is also a woman. I actually sat next to her on an airplane not too long ago. Marsha McNutt, she's a geophysicist. The uh, chief scientist of the Department of Agriculture is Kathy Wotecki, uh, um, and the director of the DARPA, the Defense Advanced Projects Administration, Regina Dugan, is a mechanical engineer also. So lots is happening here, lots, um, a lot of openings for new ideas, um, but a lot of action. A lot of people have been committed to spending every day trying to make things better, and um, from the very top, um, from the president, so I hope that makes you feel encouraged. So going forward, um, you know, I guess what I would uh, say is, first of all, be intentional. You know, think carefully about what you're doing and about, um, you know, sometimes I know I often try to, uh, I used to have a long commute driving to my job, and so when I was in the car, I, if I was feeling in a grumpy mood, I'd say, now why exactly am I having to have this long commute? What is the point about this job? And I would have to think, okay, now I choose to do this job because, and the commute goes with the fact that I also choose to sleep with my husband whose job is a little further the other way. And uh, so I think the point is, is that you're in charge of your life, nobody else is. And so if you kind of wander around, um, it's kind of your own problem. So it's important to um, be intentional. Realize that if you're in a boring meeting, why are you in that boring meeting and what can you do to either make it more interesting, either leave, or you know, find another job, but just don't waste your own time. Uh, mentor, give back. Um, I already talked about that, but I do think that's important. Um, speak up. Um, you know, you do have a responsibility to make things better in your own school. And I'm, you know, hearing the things that were talked about this morning. Many of you are already organizing your own groups. You're organizing your own networks. I mean, I think about the context in which you do work, and I think that you know, includes women in innovation, and by showing up today, that's clear all of you are already thinking about the broader context in which you do national security, in which you do national science, that kind of thing. And then be a role model yourself for future generations of women innovators. And I say that, and one of the things I've been struck by are these articles about the Facebook IPO. I don't know if you're all reading it, but there is, you know, a great article about Charles Sandberg who I guess if the IPO goes as they think it's gonna go is going to be the richest um, you know, entrepreneurial woman in this country. But one of the interesting things to me, she's from the Bay Area, which is uh, in Northern California, which is where I'm from. A lot of articles about her over the years and more recently are about these series of dinners that she's been having for close to 10 years where she's just had a responsibility that she took upon herself to just gather together uh, younger women and women from different disciplines. And I just think that's um, a pretty cool thing that each of us can do something. And even now our, our nation's richest entrepreneur, if the IPO goes through, you know, is uh, standing up, being intentional. And so all of us can do that as well. So that's all the comments I was gonna make and um, open to questions. Thank you very much for inviting me. So what we're going to do, because we have a great opportunity here, is um, I'm going to welcome NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden to give some remarks, and then we're going to take questions for Pat and Charlie, uh, and I'm going to be Donahue and run out, you know, and uh, get questions from you all. So think of fabulous questions now, and let me introduce NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden from Columbia, South Carolina. <laughs> Come on up, Charlie. He's a uh, four-time flown astronaut and was uh, confirmed, uh, was nominated by the president and then confirmed by the Senate in July 2009 to become the head of NASA. NASA has 18,000 employees. And as you heard this morning, 6,000 of them are women. Uh, and uh, Charlie's the head of them. And uh, he knows a lot of women. And uh, he's an inspiration to us all. And uh, so I'm going to introduce Charlie. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you, Dr. Falcone, for your inspiring remarks. And um, I, I want to thank you for your service to the nation also. Uh, you have done an incredible job. I, I had an opportunity to talk with her a little bit back in the back and, and learn a teeny bit. Um, I can't think of a more important use of STEM uh, education than in the job that you're doing, Pat, and uh, I think to ensure America's national security. Uh, Dr. Falcone mentioned something. I hope you all heard it uh, when she talked about her education at Princeton, uh, but I want to emphasize it again. She, um, in 1974, she became the first woman to get a degree in engineering at Princeton, uh, which I think is quite a feat. Um, I am also told that she went on to become the third, only the third woman to get a PhD at Stanford. Uh, she says she managed, uh, but a PhD in engineering also. So uh, Dr. Falcone is both a trailblazer and a role model for all of us. I, I want to thank all of you for coming today. Uh, NASA was, um, it was a special treat for us to be able to, to sponsor this event. And uh, I hope all of you have had a good time, have enjoyed yourselves but have, uh, have gotten something from this day. And I want to, you are here, if you, if you didn't have a commitment or an interest in STEM, I don't think you would be here. So I, uh, I applaud you and I thank you for your commitment to STEM education and to innovation in the aerospace field. I also want to take a moment to thank the organizers of this event, um, our host, the GW Space Policy Institute, and our team from NASA, beginning with uh, Deputy Administrator Lori Garver, who spoke with you all earlier this morning uh, in, in opening the conference. And I also want to thank NASA Assistant Deputy Administrator for Policy and Strategy, Rebecca Spike, and, and Re Rebecca Spike Kaiser. <laughs> That's right. Uh, who is an incredible uh, mother and everything. And we have a good time because Rebecca can come in sometime and, you know, there was a kid who was sick and you have to figure out, okay, how do I get to work and do all this stuff? And it's incredible to watch her balance. Uh, you talk about life-work balance. Um, my encouragement to all of you, because I have a daughter who is, I don't know, she's, she's unmarried. And, uh, and, and I will say, uh, Pat, I'm not sure how, at what stage of your life you got married, but she did say something that, that struck me, and it's, you know, you have to be intentional and you have to decide that you are going to have uh, a balanced life. You want to have a family and you want to be a professional and you can do it. And, and uh, my, my comment will be, if you put it off until you establish yourself in your career, uh, you run the risk of falling in love with your profession, uh, which is fine. Uh, but I would just I would just offer that, and I, I I I talk about Rebecca all the time because I think she made a decision early in her life that she wanted to be both a mother and a professional, and has done it incredibly well, as I think Pat has. So, just food for thought, if you will. Um, I also want to thank White House Fellow Deborah Krishan, who is um, uh, I am privileged to have working with me for this year. Uh, she is an incredible woman in her own right. And, uh, and then I want to thank the entire Women at NASA website team. I want to encourage all of you, as I think you have been, as has been done all day long, to go to women.nasa.gov women to view the testimonials of 32 extraordinary NASA women, from scientists and engineers to policy analysts and managers. These women are essential to our vision of reaching new heights and revealing the unknown so that what we do and learn benefit all humankind. We're fortunate to have five of the women who appear on the new Women at NASA website with us this afternoon. I'm going to embarrass them. I hope not, to be quite honest. But I am going to, to call their names and ask them if they would stand in case all of you may not have met them yet. Uh, first of all, from the Goddard Space Flight Center, Charlene Butler. From uh, Kennedy Space Center, Tiffany Miller Alexander and Charmel Jones. Darlene Boykins and Hashima Hassan from NASA headquarters. And I thank all of you for what you do and uh, congratulations for being featured on NASA, Women at NASA. Thank you. You know, you shared your stories of inspiration, and uh, I don't think you will understand the impact of doing so until you, you meet someone on the street 10, 20 years from now, and they say, you know, 
I remember when I was an intern or I was a co-op or I was something at NASA and I saw you on uh, Women at NASA and I decided then that I was going to do something. Uh, as mentors, you, you, you are not seeking instantaneous gratification because it does not come, but it does come at some time in your life. Um, you know, I have a slightly different view of Women's History Month than some people. Um, there's never been a month or a moment in my life where I questioned the indispensable power, potential, and contributions of women. Maybe that stems from the example of my own mother, who taught me at an early age that regardless of race, gender, background, or income, there was nothing I couldn't do. My mother was a teacher and a librarian, but at heart she was an explorer. Her field of exploration was not deep space, but education. Her vehicles were literature, history, and reading, and her destination was the untapped potential of an, and empowerment of young girls and boys who she believed could succeed despite the obstacles of discrimination and poverty that were so prevalent in the South Carolina of her time. So I grew up knowing the power of women. I'm blessed to be married to a strong black woman, Alexis Jackie Bolden, who I have known since we were the age of three. That's right. <laughs> Uh, there is a story told, I can't verify it because my father is looking down on us from heaven now, but that our two families uh, were at the beach, and uh, Jackie denies this, but I'm told she was bow-legged, and that my father looked at her father and said, save the bow-legged one for Charles. <laughs> and that was uh, how our relationship began when we were three. I see you shaking your head. My wife denies that also. But she's not here, so I can tell it. Uh, we're blessed with an incredible daughter. We have a son, but I'm not going to talk about him today. He's a lieutenant colonel in the Marine Corps at the Pentagon. But we're blessed with an incredible daughter, Dr. Kelly Bolden, who is a medical doctor and a plastic surgeon at Providence Hospital here in the District of Columbia. A question was asked in the last session, I want to go into medicine, but I also want to be an engineer, or I want to get into engineering. Kelly always knew she wanted to be a doctor, but she also didn't know whether she was going to be successful in getting in med school, always had an interest in STEM-related areas, and so she decided that, uh, don't ask me why she decided this, that as a safety net, she would do a dual degree in an undergraduate, so she majored in chemistry at Spelman College in Atlanta, and then went for two more years to Georgia Tech where she earned uh, a dual degree in chemi chemistry and chemical engineering before going to medical school at Baylor. So if you're focused and you know what you want to do, you can do anything that you set your mind to. Um, you know, finally, my wife and I are the proud granddaughters of three beautiful, smart, energetic granddaughters. Michaela is 11, Kira is 9, Talia is 5. Michaela plans to be a rocket scientist, and um, I... I she is my son, those are my son's daughters, and several years ago when they were going to come to visit us when we were living in Houston from San Diego, Michaela called, and they call me Oji, which is, we live two years in Japan, and Oji is short for Oji-san, which is grandfather in Japanese. And so Michaela called, she said, Oji, I know what I want for Christmas. I said, Michaela, what do you want for Christmas? She said, I want to meet a rocket scientist so I can ask questions. You know, we were living in Houston, the home of the Johnson Space Center, and so I said, Michaela, I think we can arrange that. And, uh, and sure enough, she came for Christmas with the rest of the family. And the good thing was, one of my down-the-street neighbors was a gentleman by the name of Bo Bemick, who is, some of you who are JSC know Bo. Bo is a, Bo is a rocket scientist, and, uh, and an incredible rocket scientist. And I, I, I'd see Bo on the street all the time. I was retired at the time, I thought, not doing very well retired. I was being unsuccessful at it. And uh, I said, Bo, I have, a, I have my granddaughters coming, and one of them wants to be a rocket scientist, and her only request for Christmas is to meet a rocket scientist. Would you say hello to her? He said, yeah, bring her down. And so I took her down to, to Bo's house. I had told her about it, and she wanted to know. She said, Oji, can I make a PowerPoint presentation? <laughs> I said, no, Michaela. <laughs> you, you know, you're just going down to meet him, and you want to listen. You don't, you don't need to sell him on you. 
So when they came and we got ready to walk up the street, I noticed she had sort of a folder in her hand, much like I had. And I said, Makili, what's in your folder? She said, well, you told me I couldn't do a PowerPoint display, but I, I did a di diagram of my rocket. And so I thought it was going to be a piece of paper like this with a rocket. We get down to Bo's, and Bo invited us in, and we went in the kitchen. And uh, we're sitting around the kitchen table, and Michaela opens up her notebook, and she pulls out nine sheets of paper. And she has taken her rocket design, and she has drawn it on these nine pieces of paper. So we have this huge diagram of a rocket that she has on the ground. And she and Bo sat around that kitchen table. Bo went and got some of his rocket models and everything. And, and for about two hours, they talked about making rockets. And why did she put this part in the design? And why did she put that part in the design? And she could explain what it was, you know, why, why she had this. She had a net that was a debris shield and uh, all other kinds of stuff. So it is important for all of us, me as a grandfather, to be a role model to my granddaughters and to my daughter. Uh, so that they know that people do believe in them and that they can do anything that they want to do. As a bit of a history buff, I, I'm also aware that there's some outstanding scientists and mathematicians throughout history who are women. Expatia of Alexandria in 400 AD became the head of the Platonist school of Alexandria. During her life, she discouraged mysticism and encouraged logical and mathematical studies. Emile de Chatelet lived from 1706 to 1749. She was a French physicist and mathematician who translated Newton's Principia into French. She distinguished herself as a, as a, she disguised herself as a man in order to study science. Maria Mitchell, who lived from 1818 to 1889, was the first professional woman astronomer in the United States and the first woman to gain membership in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1848. She once said, I quote, we especially need imagination in science, question everything, unquote. She was so right. I will paraphrase a saying, it, it's really uh, necessity is the mother of invention, but I will say innovation is the mother, imagination is the mother of innovation. And innovation is what we do at NASA and throughout the aerospace industry. I am proud of the contributions women have made and continue to make at NASA at every level. We're determined to keep that pipeline flowing through recruitment, support, and promotions, as well as our investments in STEM. America needs you. Aerospace needs you. We at NASA need you. The good news, as we learned from the new Girl Scout study, is that an overwhelming majority, 74% of high school girls across the country are interested in STEM studies. We just have to do a better job of breaking down those old barriers and unleashing their potential. Look out at this room, if you would, just look around. A room full of eager students and young professionals. I have no doubt that you're the ones who will lead us to a better tomorrow. I thank you for this opportunity to participate in this forum, and I thank you for participating today. And uh, Pat, if you want to come back up, I think we, do, we may have some time to try to answer some questions. So thank you. Right there, Rebecca, on the aisle, almost yeah. in the back. Oh, there. Yeah. Easier. It's easier for us to see you from this. Okay, place. and people could come up here too. Question over here. Good afternoon. I'm Lois Tett with Majority of Women Owned Businesses, and we followed NASA for the longest in terms of small business contracts. And at one point, we were told that there would be an explosion of low Earth technology, as you see, that's clearly come to pass. Uh, they also said that at least 60 or over 60 percent of the positions uh, that are filled at NASA are from contractors. Is that true? Can, you, add, can you say just the last part of the question? 60, over 60 percent of the jobs at NASA are contractors. 85 percent of the funds that are in the NASA, but I have a 17.7 .7 billion dollar budget, and 80 and uh, 85 percent of of those funds go 
uh, to the outside. So we have about 40,000 uh, contractors uh, who support our 17, 18,000 civil servants. So the vast majority of people who work NASA programs are NASA contractors or private industry. Uh, and, and I tell people that all the time when we talk about building rockets and, and people who are nervous about our, our effort to, to enter into a, a, an era where we have commercial companies, private companies providing transportation for astronauts to and from space. Uh, it's not new. Uh, the, the, the concept of having them be responsible and us rent or lease the service is new, but um, from the earliest days of Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, it was always an American aerospace company working hand in glove with NASA that, that built the, the, the machines for us. So it, it's more than 60 percent. Okay. A question down there. Ruth, I'll get your microphone. Hi. So this question is mostly for, um, for you, Dr. Falcone. I'm, I'm very interested in getting into public policy related to STEM, but specifically STEM education um, after I have my Ph.D. Is that something that OSTP is involved in, public policy for STEM education, or where would you recommend me looking for opportunities in that area? Well, OSTP has just led um, an inventory of all of the federal STEM um, programs and uh, submitted that and is, you know, to Congress actually for discussion. So OSTP is involved at the coordination level, but the actual development of specific STEM programs goes on in departments and agencies, and certainly NASA has a huge um, set of activities. So the real doing of, you know, policy and making it work does happen in a variety. All the science agencies have a role, and of course the Department of Education has a role. So I'd look, the, and the NGO community as well. Hi, my name is Megan Roulard. I work with the LaRouche Political Action Committee for our science research team. I, I wanted to raise it. It does seem that there are some real strategic and economic considerations which are determining a lot about what's possible for women and others in terms of innovation and a real uh, frontier policy at NASA and in, in aerospace. Uh, I recently watched a hearing, a congressional hearing, on the Webb Telescope, and various panelists from NASA were asked uh, by congressmen because of the you know, budget cut requirements from the administration, do you want a new heavy launch vehicle or do you want the Webb Telescope? Um, you know, nobody really answered either way on this one, but that's typical of the state of things. We also, under the administration, have required the current, uh, you know, the space shuttle dependent on other countries to get back up to the space station, including Russia. We generally, under this administration, have had a very provocative policy stance towards them. Um, so my question is, uh, you know, what's the real prospect for innovation and real creativity at NASA for women and otherwise, given these very real strategic and e economic considerations and the current policy? And I'd add, you know, including Typical being the examples I gave, I don't think a continuation of the current policy uh, bodes well for the future. Well, I, I, I wouldn't agree with your, uh, with your assessment. I'm, I'm not as pessimistic as you, as you seem to sound. Uh, what was done in 2010 when we were working through the budget process was the president and the Congress and the, the chief players were actually Senator Kay Bailey Hutchinson, Hutchinson Senator Nelson, uh, Congresswoman Johnson and Congressman Hall from the House uh, came together and, and recognized that we needed, NASA needed to have prior, our work prioritized. And so the agreement between the President and the members of Congress was that there would be three priority endeavors for NASA. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is the, the foremost scientific undertaking not to, to do away with other things, but as the, the, the hallmark, if you will. Um, the heavy lift launch vehicle and multi-purpose crew vehicle as the instrument to facilitate a, an exploration program, know, recognizing that, that you can't explore until we get new technology, so a, a space technology program is necessary, and, and we've asked for funding for that. This year, 2012, is the first year that NASA actually has a, technology, a space technology funding line in our budget. 
Uh, it's $575 million. May not sound like a lot to you, but when, it's, when it was zero last year, that's a lot. And, and what we're asking for this year is $699 million. Uh, and then the third priority was, um, was enhanced utilization of the International Space Station as a national laboratory. Now that we have agreed, the international partners have agreed to extend it to at least 2020, we cannot do that without a capability to get our crews and, and cargo to space. And so that's where we found the necessity of phasing out shuttle uh, because it was decided after the Columbia accident all the way back in 2004 Phasing out shuttle is the, is the vehicle for transportation and allowing American industry to take over that, that responsibility. Uh, we are well on the way to that. Um, so sh um, commercial crew and cargo will support the International Space Station. Those are the three priorities, but we still have uh, what I would say is, I don't use the term robust, but if I were to list for you the science missions that are either in progress right now, and there are more than 80, uh, we have about 56 of them that are operational projects, even as we speak, and about 28 that are in development, and some will be launched uh, later this month on into the 2018s when the James Webb Space Telescope is. So the opportunities for women, uh, for minorities, for anyone who wants to enter the STEM field, I think, are rich. Uh, our, our problem is going to be uh, getting people who are interested in STEM education, getting people interested in STEM education, first of all, uh, getting them into college with the courage to take the difficult courses that Pat kept alluding to so that they can get through the undergraduate curriculum and then, if they want to, to go on to a graduate and postgraduate uh, degrees. Thank you. We, we could take one last question. This is your chance, head of NASA and first graduate in engineering from Princeton. Hi. Um, from a policy standpoint, what do you see happening in terms of engaging more girls and women in STEM in the next five years? <laughs> well, we're trying to work on it on a number of levels. You know, um, I'm surprised that the numbers aren't bigger. I went to college, you know, in the 70s um, when things were really opening because of the wide cultural changes in this country. And um, I just don't understand why it didn't just keep going. But what are we specifically trying to do? Because it's so fun, I mean, really. And um, so specifically, we're trying to you know, make um, teachers more comfortable with math and science at every level, trying to be more intentional about informal science. I think that's a very big uh, role. I didn't talk about the um, White House Easter egg roll. That's something I've worked on the last couple of years because um, we have science activities there. We make paper bag kites, and what's so great about that? You know, the egg roll is for young, very young children. But the thing about paper bag kites is that there's not a prescriptive way to make it. So it's experimental. It has the first ladies. Let's move to it. So the point is, uh, doing science and engineering isn't always about what you do in school. I mean, as you're capturing interest and attention. And we're trying to reform uh, teaching and change the workplace by having flexibility to talk about it. So I think there's a big push on all of these actions coming along you know, early, attracting people, making uh, the teachers more comfortable, because many of our elementary teachers are not really all that comfortable sometimes with math and science, so you, we want to support them more. We want to have changed education, and we want to have just a great system of jobs, both in the private sector and in the public sector, so, um, you know, that we make it work for whole careers. I will add something. Pat talked about the First Lady and, and the President's interest in STEM education. Uh, one of the most exciting things I've had the opportunity to do since becoming the NASA Administrator, and it was two summers ago, uh, when the First Lady decided that it would be a good idea to do an evening of uh, stargazing. And on the south lawn of the White House, um, we brought in, I want to say, two dozen telescopes of all sizes, shapes, and forms, uh, a, a, a mobile planetarium inside a tent. And uh, the First Lady and the President and the First Family, in fact, came out. It was a cold night uh, initially, and it was completely clouded. And uh, because I, I am a person who believes God works in mysterious ways. Uh, as the President and the First Lady emerged, the sky cleared. And, uh, and, and it was a, just a beautiful starlit night. And these were, they had 200 inner city kids 
uh, boys, girls, um, who came out. And for many of them, it was, it was the first time they'd ever seen a telescope. And to have an astronomer uh, help them figure out which end to look into, go into the planetarium, uh, it, it was just absolutely mesmerizing for me to see that. At NASA, you know, Pat has mentioned trying to give teachers confidence in teaching math and science so that they can reach young women. We have a uh, third year coming up on a three-year pilot program called Summer of Innovation, where we at NASA have focused on middle school kids, because I am a believer that high school's too late. Uh, you know, we, we really need to be in, in elementary school, but we can't do that. So we're focused on middle school kids and their teachers mainly, because we can reach 1,000 kids. If we reach 1,000 teachers, we have now reached, multiply that times 22 in a classroom. And so what we do is we expose them uh, to all that we have in NASA, our content. We are not the Department of Education by any stretch of the imagination, but we bring in people who can talk about STEM education, who can give teachers tools, who can show them where they can go to the NASA website and, uh, and, and make themselves comfortable with basic science so that when they stand in front of a classroom, they're not afraid, uh, they're not intimidated because students know that. And so now we have teachers who can go in front of their classroom and inspire their kids to want to be scientists and engineers. And also help them understand, I like this, that the engineer is not just the person in the first car of a train. You know, the engineer is a person that makes things and does things. Thank you all very much. Thank you all so much for this wonderful, wonderful day, uh, for your participation, your input, your thoughts, your energy, and thank you to all our wonderful speakers. One administrative note, um, Foggy Bottom Metro has just reopened after an incident, but it's single tracking, so there are delays. So you may want to go to Farragut West, um, and so just a heads up on that. Thank you all. Liquid Galaxy, by the way, downstairs is still open. Please go down and check it out. It's absolutely fabulous. And thank you all again. <laughs>